Welcome to tonight's presentation. The infamous murder case of Amanda Knox, the American student killer, as some people refer to her as, who was accused and indeed went to jail but was then liberated for the murder of Meredith Kircher, a young English student who in 2007 studied in Perugia, in Italy. They shared the same cottage. Now for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to assume that you're conversant with all the material in the case, and I'm just going to bring to bear from my experience, having read almost every book that was written on the case that was worthy reading, I have a smattering of the books here. Raffaele's book, Honor Bound, where he claims that he was innocent and he stuck by Amanda even though he'd only known her for one week, because as a matter of honor, Amanda's autobiography, Waiting to be Heard, where she tries to answer all the accusations against herself. Some think convincingly, other things think not convincingly at all. The Fatal Gift of Beauty, which is a whitewash of her, saying it was because of her looks that she was framed, because she was a beautiful young woman. Angel Face of Barbie Nadal, a very thought-provoking book that clearly fingers Abanda as the killer of Meredith and involves a very interesting scenario, which I'm going to get to in another video. And finally, Death in Perugia by John Folang, which is a very interesting book, is filled with facts, extremely well researched. But in addition to this, I say, I have had access to extensive information on the case and I've been involved with it. So now without further ado, I'm going to present the facts as they stand against Amanda Knox. First and foremost, five drops of mixed blood. Amanda Knox's blood and Meredith Kircher, the murder victim's blood, inside the house where she was murdered. Blood dries in less than half an hour. So if Amanda was not involved in the murder and was indeed not in the house, as she claims now, how can she possibly explain that there were these five drops of blood that weren't inside Meredith's room where she was murdered, it's true, but they were in the corridor, in the bathroom, and in another room? That's point number one. Um, the statistical chances of that happening are almost, uh, must be one in millions. Amanda claims that she had multiple piercings in her ear that had been recently done and that she was menstruating and this could possibly explain how her blood would have come to be on the faucet of in the bathroom remains extremely difficult to, uh, to explain. The second uh, fact which I want to bring in front of you is that there was a fake break-in in an adjacent room all the affairs in the room were scattered all over and the glass, the window was broken, but the glass was on top of the scattered affairs, which clearly indicated that the window was broken after somebody had rummaged through the room. So the police are almost certain that it was a fake break-in. And in that room is one of those mixed drops of blood of Amanda and Meredith. How did it get there? Very, very difficult to explain. How can one explain that Amanda was at a quarter to eight at a little convenience store the morning after the murder and that she bought bleach? In fact, when the police arrived around noon the day after the murder, they found Amanda with a mop and a bucket in her hand. She comes up with her own explanation, and in another video I'll get into that. But the owner of the store unmistakably and under oath identifies her and must bear in mind that her physique whilst it could be fairly usual in Seattle, stood out very much. Her pale skin and her swimming pool blue eyes were very atypical of an Italian physique. So very difficult to explain away. How do you explain that they gave each other as their alibis? They said they were at Raffaele's flat that was inside the town, whereas the cottage where the murder was committed was a little bit outside of the town. Why did they say they were at a different location, use each other as an alibi, and why then did Raffaele, in his first interview or interrogation with the police, said, I told you a bunch of silly lies. Amanda went out at nine o'clock and didn't return until one in the morning, and I have no idea where she was. So Raffaele threw Amanda under the bus in his first interview with the police. How do we explain that? How do we explain even more extraordinarily that Amanda changed her story whilst being interrogated by the police and said, whilst I told you as I, I was at Raffaele's, I now admit that I was at the cottage. And not only did she say that, but she said, I heard these blood-curdling screams 
and as she told the people present, and there were several people that attested to this, she put her hands over her ears and her whole body went into almost a convulsion. Why did she add that detail, which was corroborated by a neighbor who said that she had heard these same blood-curdling screams? How did Amanda know necessarily there had been screams? Amanda later changed her story back and said, no, in fact, the police just pressured me and they made me say that. But why did she add that piece of information? Very strange. How was it conceivable to explain? I found no explanation for this, although I thought about it for a great length of time. They introduced, as you know, the murder weapon as being a knife found at Raphael's apartment, not at the cottage, but his apartment in his kitchen. And in the first trial, where they were condemned, respectively, to 25 and 26 years, they said that there was DNA of Meredith on the blade and that there was Amanda Knox's fingerprints on the handle. And Raffaele volunteered to the police, perhaps very foolishly, the following piece of information. Oh, yes, I recall. Once when Amanda was in my kitchen and we were preparing dinner, I pricked her finger accidentally. The only problem is it turned out that Meredith had never been to his flat and he admitted that himself later. That seems very, very difficult, if not impossible, to explain why somebody would say something like that. It seems very, very suspicious. Why was it that there were footprints in the hall outside Meredith's room leading to the bathroom that had been washed away with bleach and they were brought back to life through luminol, you know, the substance that forensic police use to reveal the presence of blood after it's been washed away. Why does the footprint on the bath mat correspond, according to all norms of forensic comparisons and police work, to Raffaele's shoe size and the exact shape and the make of his shoe? Very difficult to explain. Why did Amanda and this seems almost unbelievable, why from prison did she reiterate her confession and say, I confirm what I said in my confession, I was at the house and I heard the screams. She did say admittedly that it was confusedly that she remembered it, that it was as if in a dream, and I'll get to that in another video. Why could it be that Amanda couldn't remember? It seemed like a strange dream. Well, she was taking a lot of drugs and she was drinking but that's not the subject of tonight's videos. So why did she spontaneously offer that when no pressure was being put on her if, as she claims, she was basically pressurized by the police into making a false confession? Why did she finger Patrick Lumumba, her boss, who was always very kind with her by her own admission, and who ran a bar called The Sheik where she worked, why did she finger him as the murderer when she knew that he wasn't, when he had an alibi, and why did she say, I was in the cottage and Patrick went into the room and murdered Meredith? Why for two weeks did she let Lumumba sit in jail under the suspicion of murder being interrogated by the police? Very difficult or perhaps impossible to explain, although I'm not taking part for her guilt or her innocence. I'm just presenting different facts. Why, when she gave an interview to Diane Sawyer, the most extensive interview that she gave when she came back to the States, when Sawyer specifically asks her, were you at the cottage that night? And of course, the whole case revolves around that. Was she there or was she not? Was she lying when she said that to the police? Was she lying when she said that she was somewhere at a different location? Why does she say no? in a quite contrived way where you can, all of her answers you can feel, if you know something about forensic psychiatry, are very, very guarded and she's thinking very carefully. So she thinks and then she says no, but as she says no, she clearly nods. I encourage you to go and watch that interview. It's very, very strange and there's a real incongruency between her verbal and her nonverbal language. So that seems very strange indeed. Why did her and Raffaele turn off their cell phones that night. It's the only time they ever did it when they were in Perugia. They turned their cell phones off at the same time and they turned them on the next morning at the same time in the morning. Perfectly congruent one with the other. Well, we know that people can be traced by their phones, by the cellular phones, by triangulation, and police experts can tell where people were. 
So that seems another fact which is very difficult to explain. They come up with explanations, but they don't seem particularly credible. Why was Amanda's behavior, and you can't condemn a person just on their behavior, of course, but why did she, was she so callous, so insensitive, that all of Meredith's friends, when they were being interviewed by the police and they were waiting together in the waiting room, they, they said they found her behavior disgusting. It was so callous. She was snuggling up, kissing, acting puerile, sticking her tongue out at her boyfriend, Raffaele. At another point, she did a cartwheel at the police shop. They didn't go to the commemoration ceremony that was held in honor of Meredith a few days after she was killed, where hundreds of students went to pay homage because they were deeply touched, and of course all of Meredith's friends. And why the afternoon, or actually the early evening of that same day, where they caught on video in a shop, and Amanda was buying some lingerie underwear, and why were they talking about having hot sex and giggling with each other? It seems very difficult to explain if indeed Amanda really cared about Meredith, and if she had sincere feelings for her. So again, be, we can't condemn somebody just on incongruent behavior, but it's, some, it's a question that's worth asking oneself. So I would say these are the essential questions that arise in the accusation of Amanda. And I thank you for your attention, and I ask you um, to be kind enough to watch my subsequent videos where I'll give the case for Amanda the reasons for which she should not be condemned, for which reasonable doubt exists. And then I'll give another case going into the whole history and genesis of the case and all the elements, the sex, the alcohol, the allegations of orgiastic sex, the haunting beauty of Perugia as a medieval town, and I'll cover a more general aspect of the case. Thank you for your attention.